Well, good morning, and thank you for joining me and three of Denver's most influential political leaders today for a conversation about the astonishing trajectory of the city of Denver, about leadership, the importance of civil discourse, and of course, serving the public good. This event, I'm Jeremy Hafner, I'm chancellor here at the University of Denver, and this event is uh, one of several parts of our inauguration week, culminating in Friday ceremony and followed by the University of Denver's homecoming weekend. I hope all of you can attend these great events either in person or virtually. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce our three guests, but I wanna make it clear they really need no, no introduction. I'm gonna start with Mayor Wellington Webb, Mayor Webb, it's great to have you here. So welcome. It's a pleasure. As Denver's 42nd mayor from 1991 to 2003, a 12-year term. You have had incredible, impressive career and you hold several degrees, a Master's of Arts and a Bachelor of Arts in Sociology from the University of Northern Colorado and four honorary doctor degrees. You have served in the Colorado State Legislature You've served as regional director to the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services under President Jimmy Carter, as director, as executive director of Colorado's Department of Regulatory Agencies, and as Denver City Auditor. As well, you have experience in higher education, once serving as a teacher and faculty member at the University of Colorado, as well as Colorado State University. Now, during your time as mayor, among the many accomplishments, you oversaw the completion of Denver International Airport. You helped expand open space in our city, including adding 2,000 acres of new parks and open space to the city. And of course, you were also Denver's first black mayor and the only mayor in US history to serve as president of the US Conference of Mayors, the National Conference of Democratic Mayors, and the National Conference of Black Mayors. You currently- Thank you, Jeremy, and I'll be back next week. <laughs> <laughs> and lastly, I'll simply add that I have firsthand knowledge that you are also a hell of a father. So well done, my friend. It's wonderful Thank to you. have you. Senator John Hickenlooper, welcome. Of course, you, you serve as the United States Senator from Colorado, but you also served as Denver's 43rd mayor for eight years from 2003 to 2011, as well as you served as Colorado's 42nd governor from 2011 to 2019, a very impressive career. You hold a Bachelor of Arts in English and a Master's in Geology from Wesleyan University. As mayor, you helped eliminate the city's budget deficit you helped lead the construction of one of the most ambitious mass transit projects in the country. You advocated for accessible early childhood education. You opened up one of the first offices of sustainability in the country, and you established the Denver Scholarship Foundation, which provides tuition assistance to students entering colleges. And on behalf of all my colleagues at the universities and colleges in Colorado, thank you. And I should note that you may need to leave our conversation after about the first 30 minutes or so. Uh, you have important business to attend to, but we're so happy you could fit us into what I'm sure is an incredibly demanding schedule. So thank you. Of course. And last but not least, Mayor Michael Hancock. You're currently serving as Denver's 45th mayor, now in your 10th role, a year in this role. And I will never forget, Mayor Hancock, when I first met you at the Tivoli Center during the International Student Day that you were championing. It was a Saturday and you were wearing sneakers. And we talked about the importance of being comfortable. And little did I know what a profound impact that would have on me since sneakers are my sort of thing right now as well. And I just kept remembering, said, wow, I'm sitting next to the mayor of Denver. How cool is that? Now, prior to serving as mayor, you too had an impressive resume, a Bachelor of Arts from Hastings College and a Master's of Public Administration from the University of Colorado. You've served as president of the Metro Denver Urban League. 
In 2003, you were elected to the Denver City Council where you led on issues such as complex citywide finances, economic development, and children advocacy. Since being sworn in as mayor in 2011, supporting equity has been central to your platform. You've also faced historic challenges, including, of course, the current COVID-19 pandemic. I also understand you're an appropriately avid Broncos fan and your resume lists your role as Huddles of Broncos mascot. So well done on that one as well. I'm sure our students and community surely have much to glean from your experience. So I want to thank you also for joining us. Absolutely. Now, one last note for the audience Mayor Federico Pena um, extends his well wishes. He would have joined us today, but uh, for a major scheduling conflict, and we understand and wish him well. And finally, before we get started, the spirit of this event is to have a conversation. And I am looking forward to asking questions, but even more looking forward to the discourse and exchange from all three of you. So without further ado, let's begin. Uh, and the topic here is legacy projects, big signature projects, because there's been so much that has happened over the 40 years where Denver has just experienced tremendous transformation. DIA, the Rockies, the Convention Center, parks, the light rail system, and so much more. As mayors, each of you have had your footprint in multiple Denver legacy projects or initiatives. And I know that servant leadership, supporting others, is at the core of who each of you are. So I'm going to start with Mayor Hancock. So, Mayor, can you share with us how your leadership journey came to pass and what about being a leader initially attracted you? And what do you consider as your signature project so far? Well, Chancellor, let me first say, I'm so excited to be here with you and, and to be with two of my uh, mentors and friends who really, and I mean this, we, we, can, uh, we can all agree, we, we have leaned on each other and consulted one another, even when we're gonna hear things maybe we don't want to hear. Um, they tell us what we need to hear. We tell each other what we need to hear, but. Uh, and, and Mayor uh, Webb and, and Senator Hickelooper, I have two guys that I know I can call at any time and, and get their words of wisdom and, and insight. Uh, but you know what led me in this journey in leadership really is growing up in a neighborhood that I grew up in. First, I'm the youngest of 10 children. And if you don't learn how to navigate and learn how to make do uh, and get your way and figure out how to be diplomatic and all that good stuff, compromise, uh, as the youngest of 10, you never, you're not going to survive. And, and uh, really, that was kind of the laboratory that I grew up in in my family. Um, and, and then of course, the neighborhood of Northeast Denver, where I grew up attending schools, Buster Steck Elementary School, uh, attending Cole Middle School and ultimately Manual. We were all expected to be leaders, no matter what you were doing, whether you were a cheerleader, football player, uh, student council, um, Decker Club, whatever you were involved in, there was an expectation inside that building at Manual High School that you would be a leader. and. Uh, those are the very values that were instilled in me going forward. And they created a very fertile ground for all of us to kind of nurture our skills, running meetings, speaking in public, um, working closely with adults, working closely and being collaborative with our uh, fellow classmates. Um, those are values that many of us walked away. And it's no surprise when you look over the history of our high school that at Manuel, that we have four mayors that have served, four people have served as mayors of major cities in this country um, and have, and others have gone on to play major roles in the private sector and uh, in the nonprofit community. So that's where it all came from. And that expectation, I have a dear friend who, who wrote a book and he was talking to a guy who was on death row. And he asked the question of this particular individual on death row, do you believe we are, we are products of our environments? And uh, the, the inmate said, actually we're products of our expectations. And, and that's, I think clearly, it's more illustrative of me coming out of that uh, Northeast Denver community of Five Points, Whittier and Cole, and ultimately being at Manual High School. Very nice. And what Legacy would wise, I got to tell you, I, you know, I look at the National Western and Saving the Stock Show as two as, you know, efforts, because uh, they were leaving when I became mayor and to find a way to keep it here for the next 100 years and now redoing 270 acres of uh, opportunity for the Stock Show, but for all of us as a National Western Heritage uh, Center. So I'll stop there. That's a, and, and you're absolutely right. That's such a gem in the crown of, uh, of, of the city of Denver. 
uh, as we wait for Mayor uh, Webb to rejoin us, uh, I'm going to turn to uh, Senator Hickenlooper. You certainly have had your hand in many projects as mayor, governor, and now senator. So what stands out to you? And you're muted. Sorry about that. I've, I've so, it's only been a year and a half, still trying to figure out how this works. So <laughs> congratulations to, to you on this uh, investiture delay, delayed a week of celebration and congratulations. I already hear the many great things you're doing at, at DU. Um, and I wanna reiterate what Mayor Hancock just said is, we mayors stick together and I will never forget, no one ever thought I'd win that election in 2003. And the day after the election, I came down to City Hall uh, and Mayor Webb very kindly, metaphorically sat me on his knee. Now that's partly a reflection. He's big enough to do that if he wanted to, but really he schooled me. And he had a book that his team had prepared on every city agency. And he laid it out in, 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 in unvarnished detail, the good, the bad, the ugly, everything. And basically said, you know, here's, here's what I think, here's what we tried to do, here's what we got done, here's our success, here's where we still have work to do. It made such a difference uh, in terms of being able to come in. And the thing I always say about Mayor Hancock is, you're, you can't be more lucky than to have someone come in after you finish a job like being mayor. So I was mayor for eight years and, and Mayor Hancock came in and did pretty much everything I'd been doing, but better. And he he took stuff I'd started on and he he expanded the vision. He created things like the, he was just talking about the stock show and the partnership between CSU and the state and, and the city of Denver. I mean, that's just, he did a remarkable job and just by his success, it makes me some, even though I'm the rear view mirror, it makes me look a little, a little more successful than perhaps I was. Uh, anyway, it's been a, a, a real pleasure these jobs is always the best part is who you get to spend time with and you invest your time with. But then, you know, uh, Wellington Webb and, and Michael Hancock has been a great joy. Uh, so the, the stuff, I mean, I loved working, getting the, the people to work together. So we worked, we got all 34 mayors in the metropolitan Denver area to work on fast tracks. Uh, we were able to bring together a lot of people that had previously not been getting along uh, and we got them, just, you know, again, of those 34 mayors, there are 21 Republican mayors who supported a tax initiative to, to build 119 miles of new light rail. Uh, it's worth pointing out that uh, DU was a part of that in, in many, uh, in laying some of the groundwork. There have been studies and, and prep, prep, preparatory uh, work that DU had laid out there and, and, and through the very process of collecting that information helped bring the community together. And that is something no one talks about in terms of the value of universities, but it was very, very important. Thank you, Senator. Um, you know, it, I can tell that there's gonna be great camaraderie here. So I'm, I'm excited to turn to uh, Mayor Webb here in just a moment. Um, but uh, you're right that the University of Denver, one of the key roles it plays is a convener. And of course, the great research that our faculty are doing is helping to provide that information to the city and the state as well. Mayor Webb, did you really school Senator Hickenlooper? Um, you know, I think that I think that's a great testimony to your leadership and guidance. Well, he didn't need much schooling. He just needed someone to help him uh, uh, look at where the bathrooms were in the building. He he, he knew what else <laughs> wanted to accomplish. But uh, John uh, has always been successful, uh, and where he wasn't successful in business, he built upon that to learn from what didn't work to make it better the second time around. And I think he's proven that in every endeavor that he's been involved in. Well, thank you. But so um, the, the topic is legacy projects. So could you share uh, with the audience here about one of the legacy projects or initiatives that you are most proud of and about the lessons learned in bringing that, that vision to life? Well, <laughs> I look at it a little different than most people, um, when when I've been asked that question before, I've said that's like choosing between which of your children you love the best. Uh, I could say it was a South Platte River project where we extended uh, the river so people could use it. I could say we built the first minority business program uh, in the country at DIA, we created nine to 10 minority millionaires at, uh, at the airport. Um, 
But what I'm most proud of was the people development. Hmm. So when I look at some of the people that worked for me, just to give you a list, Stephanie Foot, my chief uh, deputy mayor, went on to become executive director of the Girl Scouts. Wayne Cawthon, my chief of staff, went on to become city manager for the city of Kansas City, Missouri. Adam Brickner left and became head of the drug court in Baltimore, Maryland. Four of the staff members that worked for me ended up being elected to city council. Elber Wedgworth, uh, Rosemary Rodriguez, Judy Montero, and Carol Boygan. James Mejia went on to be elected to the school board as well as city council, as did uh, Rosemary. And so for some of those individuals that were deeply involved in the community, I'm most proud of them because the legacy has gone on through the individuals and not through the permanent uh, brick and mortar projects that, uh, that stand. Buildings come up, buildings come down, but the investment you make in people lives forever and it lives through generation to generation. Wow, that's, that's incredibly powerful. That, that's a Jeremy, Jer Jeremy, if I could just interrupt for one second. That's true about bricks and stuff, but, but Wellington Web created the largest addition to parks yeah. In the history of the city of Denver, that's never going anywhere, Mayor. <laughs> <laughs> that's, what, that's right. And, and if I can say, I, well, you know, I think it's important to note that as when we take over these offices, we are actually handed a baton, as I think uh, Senator Hickenlooper alluded to. We take on projects that they finish, and, and oftentimes we get the credit as if we did it. But I want you to think about uh, the fact that Mayor Webb finished the airport um, and the fact that we now have, the, you know, one of the fastest, excuse me, one of the busiest airports in the world, not just in the country, but in the world today. And, and probably number one in the country right now with our, if you've been out in their lines recently, you know what I'm talking about. And, and as a result, we're able to do things like think about outside the fence, the Aerotropolis. We could not talk about Aerotropolis and airport city and developing land in and around the airport had Hickenlooper not softened up the regional battles that were taking place. And so one thing I will add to Webb's uh, uh, cache are where our sports complexes are built. The fact that mm. they're in and around downtown, that was a strategic decision. And what it did for downtown, particularly lower downtown and, and our downtown area in general, phenomenal on sports day. It gives us hell when they're all playing at one time, but it's a phenomenal concept. These are just let, really- let, 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 me, let me just add to what Michael mentioned. And uh, Michael's always been a blue chipper since he was in high school. And we, we knew then uh, that he was going to be somebody and he was going to be uh, great and he was going to do well. Um, and um, I think my wife adopted him early on and, uh, and, and, and remains one of his biggest, big, biggest supporters. But, you know, some things we learn here also have a saying which offends some and ingratiates myself to others. If you have power, use it or lose it. Uh, you have to use what you have at your disposal. I looked at cities around the country and thought that some of these cities are digging their own grave. And I like to use Detroit as an example. Why would you go to Detroit when the football team is in uh, Pontiac, basketball teams in Auburn Hills, and they all have the logo Detroit, you know, the only thing that stayed was the Detroit Tigers and then they built the stadium incorrectly. And it was always my belief that you have to have a reason for people to come downtown. Mm -hmm. And so when we were negotiating, we wanted to make sure that where the Broncos played, where the Nuggets and Avalanche play, and where uh, the Rockies play, were all in the same area that draws people from the city as well as from the suburbs and as well yeah. as from rural areas. Um, it, it provides a sports entertainment complex and, uh, and that works and it's being now done all across the country, which, yeah. uh, we're proud of the fact that they copied that model from Denver. That's a great feature and, and just a great example. Yeah, the city of Denver is one of very few uh, cities where there are six professional team sports um, and, and as you say, kind of co-located there. So it's, a, it's an important niche and leadership role that the city of Denver plays. What great examples of servant leadership. Um, I mean, you all shared little stories, whether it's the um, the development of people, Mayor, Mayor Webb, or the collaboration, Senator Hickenlooper, and, and Mayor Hancock, I, I know from uh, hiring uh, a, a really terrific staff member from your office that you, you also served in that development role uh, substantially on that one. So it, it really is, servant leadership is a theme, I think, that's going to come through uh, today's conversation. So we were talking about um, kind of pride points in in uh, in your leadership, 
but I know our students are going to be really interested in also knowing what are some of the challenges that you faced? Uh, maybe some things that didn't quite go the way you thought uh, they might go. Um, I think the students and the audience members would really appreciate hearing some examples from, from you all on that one. So um, Senator Hickenlooper, could I start with you and just kind of get you get the conversation flowing? Sure, and there's uh, no shortage of places where uh, we learned on the job, uh, and there's there's no level of preparation that can ever prepare you for a, a job like being the mayor of a great city like Denver. Uh, but you do have that opportunity to uh, to grow and and to take the experiences you've had and 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 be at least ready to learn uh, what you need to know in real time. And we, a big part part of my uh, challenge was was assembling such a large team of people and yet wanting to be diverse. And, you know, we tried not to hire any of my political supporters. We wanted to hire the best people for the job and yet become, we wanted to be the most diverse city administration in the United States. And so we ended up 50% uh, people of color, 60% uh, women. And yet we could say in every case, we never compromised excellence in pursuit of diversity. In other words, we hired the best person for the job every time, but it took us a long time. We, I was still hiring. I didn't hire my director of, of Parks and Rec until three months in, although she was uh, African-American getting a PhD and she was the number three person in Chicago Parks and Rec. So she was better qualified for any than anyone else we looked at, but it, we didn't get to her until the third effort to make sure that we, were, we could get the diversity that we thought our rec centers really needed. That kind of learning on the job that you you know, I kind of had promised that we'd get everybody appointed in the, you know, in the first 30 days. And I got criticized for taking too long. And now I, to this day, I'm convinced we did it the right way. But you, you learn those things of not, you know, one good lesson is not to promise too much too fast. Well, that's a good one. I like that one. And hiring is so important. Talent is so critical uh, to, to these leadership roles. Mayor Hancock, how about you? You know, a couple of things come to mind. I think one is the uh, role of the media has shifted. Uh, I remember a conversation that Mayor Webb and I had one day where he says, uh, you have it easy. He said, I had two newspapers and they followed me everywhere um, in Denver. And I looked at him, I said, have you heard of social media? <laughs> <laughs> so I think the era of, of the media is different. If you don't read the newspaper, you are uninformed. If you read the newspaper, you're ill-informed. And, and I think that's a big challenge in terms of the credibility of the media. The, the rush to be first has really broken down the guardrails and the ethics of the media in terms of uh, corroboration and the ability to find three people to corroborate a story and to make sure that it, is, it, it has the integrity um, that people are being well-informed. I think technology, it was Einstein who said, I fear today when technology overtakes our lives we will be a society of idiots. Um, and, and, and I think, unfortunately, we got young people who aren't socialized anymore. Now, all the information they get is from the media, uh, I mean, uh, from their technology, and most of it is baseless. And we are seeing it um, um, in, in the issue with regards to COVID, the spread of misinformation, um, and, 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 and people, you know, really putting themselves and the rest of society in danger because of technology has overtaken their lives. And, they haven't been able to lift their heads up and, and to really seek back. And I think the last one is the, the hyper uh, political environment in which we live in. Um, you know, I don't know anyone who would willingly and joyfully enter into politics today. Uh, people are angry. Uh, people are very suspect of each other. Um, and, and everything is based on politics and partisan politics of that, which just absolutely um, drives me. Uh, but now how does vaccinations, how do wearing a mask and, and, and social distancing or staying at home to avoid further spread of a very deadly virus lends itself to po politics, but yet it did. And, and, and unfortunately, um, as a result, we've lost a lot of lives because of game, gamemanship and hyper-political environment. So I would say those three things, uh, misinformation based on the role of the media, uh, and the rush to be first there, technology that has overtaken our world, and, and thirdly, the hyper-political environment that we live in. 
Yeah, boy, um, I want to put a pin in that comment um, because we're going to circle back in the next question on on civil discourse. Right? Yes. And the role of universities in just a moment, but uh, Mayor Webb, uh, the the convers the topic is challenges. Maybe some things that um, you didn't anticipate. Maybe didn't quite go the way you did. You know, uh, we're sharing some stories for the benefit of our students, especially here who are keen on leadership here. Could you share uh, an example of a challenge or a, a, a something that didn't quite go right uh, or in, as, you in, as you anticipated? We had what was referred to as a summer of violence in which we had uh, several shootings that were taking place in the city. And it was not unusual for gangs to be operating because one, as you know, it is not illegal to be in a gang. Um, and that I had uh, citizens and residents coming to me saying, we need to do something about this gang problem. And not until it, the situation got so brazen that I can remember three incidences. One, Broderick Bell was shot in the leg as he was playing in the front yard as two uh, cars went by, one, car bloods, one car of crypts shooting at each other. The second during that same week was Ignacio Pardo who was shot, uh, the bullet, uh, they were driving down university, bullet went from one car, went into the park. He was visiting at the zoo. The bullet hit a rail and then hit a six month child in the forehead. But this distance, because it had hit the rail first, did not damage him uh, severely in the third one. We had a kid that just started working for the city. He was 14 and he was killed that weekend and he was buried with the check that he received from the city. So I called for, we did everything in terms of uh, one, we set up a curfew and uh, some parents were upset that we set the curfew up because I said we were gonna pick their kids up if they were under age. And, uh, and we did, we took them to a rec center and told the parents they had to come pick them up. And they said, well, you know, we're mad at you and, I, and our kids are mad. And I said, I'd rather have your kids mad and alive than dead and happy. Um, we were sued, uh, we won the suit. Um, the second part of that, we established a program where called the Safe City Program where people had to come in and testify in terms of what they thought could make things better. So we had, Crips had to select one spokesman mm. that would be interesting observance of getting them to select one person. Uh, the police had to select one person because the gangs called them the gang too. And, uh, and we said, what do we need? And so our goal was to try to separate the kids that were most vulnerable and try to find them jobs within the city and putting them with uh, employees that had the right uh, work ethic. And uh, and we also was able to get the newspapers to stop printing witnesses' names in the paper and on television, because before they were printing the witness's name and address in some cases, where then they would be harassed by gang members about not testifying in court. And so sometimes we had to uh, uh, take that literally head on and we, I was able to broker a truce between Bloods and Crips at 34th and St. Paul Street in the middle of the in the middle of the street. Uh, so if there was thinking outside the box, it was trying to get everybody in one room uh, to discuss where to kind of, where do, where do we go from here? Wow, that's impressive. Oh, I also caught, oh, now this would you find interesting. Now people in the South always told me this would automatically get me reelected. I called for a day of prayer and then got sued. <laughs> 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 I brought every religious faith together to, half for a day of prayer in the city and county of Denver and I had to go to court because an atheist said I couldn't do that because I used city stationery and called for a day of prayer. And I told him he was a hypocrite because he had money in his pocket that said in God we trust. But I did uh, win the court case. That's a great example uh, of a huge challenge, a tragic one, uh, of course, to, to hear that uh, it was, Lives were lost, of course, but what a collaborative approach that you, you took on that. Thank you. Well, I think also when you, you know, and John and Michael have been good at this. They, you know, they've been in the salad and they know how this works. And sometimes you get advice from some of your staff and if you don't agree with it, you know, they work for you. Uh, you have to take a different road. Uh, I was told when we made a, a shooting with a person that was uh, 
killed by the police that we made a mistake and shot the wrong person we broke in the wrong house and they said don't don't say anything because it increased the city's liability and i said well we're already liable everyone knows we went in the wrong house and shot a man that was just watching television so i went on t- television radio and apologized that we made a mistake we'll do better the next time and try to settle with his family i think we have to own up to our mistakes great example of uh, character and integrity in that, which we're going to circle back to. Um, before Senator Hickenlooper needs to leave us, if, uh, if hopefully he can stay with us, I want to turn to this topic that um, Mayor Hancock so eloquently raised, which, which is really about the divisions and polarizations in our country right now, um, in in our state, in our in our even in our city, um, civil discourse, the the art about listening across differences, especially differences that are um, quite severe, um, is a really important issue for me because I think universities need to be playing a, a really critical role. So Senator Hickenlooper, um, you know, as a leader during these past few years where there has been so much division and because you've been at the local, state and now national level, what has been your approach to civil discourse, um, you know, particularly in instances of vastly diverse opinions and, and passions, like Mayor Hancock said? Right. Um, and let me, I'm, I am going to have to jump off after this. I want to, again, thank uh, Mayor Webb and Mayor Hancock for being such great partners throughout everything. I, I would not be here without the, the efforts of, of both of them. So, uh, again, I don't often get a chance to thank them in public. So they're freely given, uh, you know, for me, and I think it's probably the sales say, we'll say, all say variations of the same thing. It's about listening and active listening. And, you know, I've never changed anybody's mind about something that is important by telling them why they're wrong and why I'm right. Uh, you know, in the restaurant business, when someone's upset, you repeat back their exact words to them and, and they feel validated, it calms them down. And I think that's part of, 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 of the foundation for civil discourse of how you get to some level of trust. I, I told our staff that we, we, we collaborate at the speed of trust. And if nobody trusts each other, which is what we see in Washington right now and in a lot of uh, government around the country, I think Denver and Colorado are somewhat unique and uh, uniquely different from that. But if, if you can't trust someone, you're not gonna be able to collaborate. So that's a big part of it. And I think that's where DU could come in. And I mean, DU is a safe place that People can express their opinions in a civil environment. Uh, I remember you guys did a panel on water years and years and years ago that got people to start talking about something that up until then had been, you know, verboten. You couldn't talk about it without people, you know, getting in, uh, getting really angry and fighting with each other. And again, I think that you need places like uh, a university like DU that uh, allow us that safe place. Anyway, thank you for including me on this. I'm going to jump off here, but what a treat to get to be with all of you. Jeremy, before John leaves, I'd like to uh, just say congratulations for him, to him, and also to Mayor Hancock, and Jeremy, also to you uh, for having the wisdom to hire my daughter. (laughs) (laughs) Who has proven proven to be a success like her mother in anything she has endeavored to do. (laughs) <laughs> that's all right take care sir. Love. Sir, so love. Much. So much. My love. you bet Thank bye-bye you. proud to have you as a senator thank you well um mayor webb um couldn't agree more and we'll have some fun in just a moment um at your daughter's expense i'm sure <laughs> one of the best hires um, i've made while at the university of denver so uh it, it's a delight to to have you here with us today Mayor Hancock, civil discourse still, um, you know, uh, what approaches do you use uh, because you're confronted with uh, discourse and conversations where the passions are real and uh, it's hard to navigate? What's your strategy? Well, what I understand, Jeremy, about me and my experience is that uh, when things have gone wrong is when I have not listened and I have tried to over get my point across as opposed to listening to someone or a group of people. Um, sometimes the only, the best way to honor someone is to be humble and to listen. And I think John, Senator Higginhoover points that out. Just be still, be prayerful while you're listening 
and, and try to actively listen and to, and to honor the approach, the, the, the voice. The other one is the approach. Be mindful of the approach. I, I'll never forget watching a sitcom where the father was angry because the kids showed up saying, we're getting married. And that's how they told the parents that they were getting married. And they couldn't understand why he was angry. And he said, see, what you don't understand is, let me give you a, a metaphor. If I wanted to, wanted to make you a steak, would you enjoy that? Go, oh, absolutely. I like it's how you like your steak. Medium well. I'm going to make you a medium well steak on the grill. And you like a baked potato? Oh, man, now you're talking fully loaded, fully loaded baked potato. I got you. And maybe a Bordeaux or a Cabernet for with that steak, would you put like, yes, now you're talking. He said, but I'm going to serve you that steak and that baked potato and that glass of wine on top, on a trash can top. Now, how you like it now? He says, I don't like it. Why would you do that? You ruin a great steak and a great baked potato and a glass of, I get it. It's not what you say. It's how you delivered it to me that makes a difference. And, and that made the difference. And, and sometimes we forget that our tone, our approach may be the impediment as opposed to the message. And we have to be mindful of that. And then the last thing I'll just add is that we got to remember our why. Why are we in this conversation in the first place? What is the real root here? And oftentimes we're arguing symptoms and we're arguing the, the offshoot of things that have gone wrong. We bring up things from the past and we completely muddle the real purpose of why we arrived at this moment in the first place um, and the battles that have already been won. So I, I, you know, I, I just think it's important for us to be good listeners, to honor the people, to understand that the approach does matter and, and to never forget and to keep your focus on why you're there in the first place. Wow. wow. You know, that, that's really pragmatic advice for, you know, those of us in the university to keep in mind as we, as we really develop uh, a framework for helping students, uh, you know, often coming to us 18, 19 you know, years old and, and equipping them with the skill sets to listen across differences and this, this very subtle art of persuasion that, that uh, we seem to have lost at times in our yeah, yeah. Mayor Webb, any any um, any things that you would like to add for civil uh, discussion? Well, I, I I we have a program which is housed at DU called Urban Leadership Foundation of Colorado, and one of the first sessions where I come in and speak to these young professionals is know your authorizing environment. Uh, you have to know your authorizing environment because half the time people get mad at the wrong people. I remember one subject was Mayor Hancock and they were saying they wanted to protest at Mayor Hancock's office because he didn't give up a tape of some shooting that took place. And I said, why are you going to protest at Mayor Hancock's office? Well, he's the mayor. I said, but he doesn't have the tape. You're supposed to go to who has the tape. The district attorney has the tape. So if you're gonna protest, you're supposed to be protesting in front of Beth McCann's office. If you want to do something about state highways, that's a state problem. That's not a city problem. You want to deal with stop sign? That's a city problem. You've got to go to the where the authorizing environment is. Otherwise, you're just spinning your wheels, spending a lot of, uh, making a lot of noise uh, with no purpose. The, the other point I try to share, because uh, I come out of the protest movement, believe it or not, years ago, because my, my, the people that I admire the most in history were Frederick Douglass, uh, Nelson Mandela and Abraham Lincoln. Mm. And, um, and that's why I started off saying you don't have to be elected to make a change. You can do that through protests and through civil disobedience. But you have to be able to demonstrate what you're fighting for, be able to explain it to everyone else, and then have a solution for the problem you're trying to solve. And if necessary, then go to jail for it. Because a lot of the kids out here now, they want to protest, but they don't want to pay the price. Right, right. right. If you're gonna if you're gonna protest, you also have to carry Dr. King's philosophy all the way to the end. King and Gandhi went to jail to fight for what they believed in. He didn't fight and carry a slogan and a sign and then go home and eat dinner. That's not what protest is about. And I think that the third option is the one that's the most uncomfortable because I, I put people in three groups. One, those that are for, two, those that are against, and three, those that are silent. Is we got to make sure the silent people are participating and understand what the issues of the day are and they're not sitting back quietly. You know, it's like we were drawing some maps of reapportionment. As one guy says that uh, 
you know, every time they go in executive session, he's for, uh, he's for the minority community. I said, well, if you're gonna be for the minority community, do it in public. Uh, don't, don't defend me in private and then hang me in public. <laughs> yeah. Wow. But, you know, uh, the, the, uh, the next area is on, on character and uh, people we admire. So we're just circling back to that in, in just a moment. But, um, you know, th that knowing authorizing uh, environment is uh, really, again, another concrete, uh, concrete piece of advice, right? And often, I think we come into these conversations not knowing really where where it's to be directed, not knowing why we're there. Uh, and, and I think those are just some very simple uh, tips that we can take away. Um, so I do want to turn to character. Uh, we've, we, the conversation has already touched on it, whether it's integrity, Mayor Webb, that, that you mentioned, or, or people that we admire, and I'm going to get to that. At the University of Denver, we've um, launched this uh, universal wide um, initiative that we call the four dimensional experience, um, advancing intellectual growth, preparing for careers and lives of purpose, promoting wellness and exploring character. Uh, and the, it's that last one that is particularly captivating to me because I, I think a discussion on character and what do we value? What, what are the virtues? Um, you know, if anyone wants to emulate are important for us. So Mayor Webb, you know, I, I heard from you uh, about integrity. I'm going to turn to you again, and then I'm going to turn to Mayor Hancock. You know, what, what are some of those character traits that um, you deeply value? You mentioned Mandela and, of course, Lincoln. Um, what character traits did they have that you admire? Um, and is there anyone else that, that you want to throw into well, them? Over time, I developed a list of who I am as a person. And I've shared this with Mayor Hancock and, and, and at the time, Mayor Hooper, as well as other mayors around the country. We all bring in the office a certain set of values that we believe in. And in many cases, that, that those values of what we believe in have to transition to our staff because they're working for us. And if they're not don't have the same set of values, then in many cases, they could be working against us. And so for me, you know, that I believe in God, I believe in, in uh, I believe in family, I believe in public service, I believe in democracy, I believe in, in, in a, uh, um, where we also are working together, a, a community of inclusion. Uh, and I, I have a list and Jeremy, when I finish my next book, I'm gonna send it to you. <laughs> believe in personal responsibility. Mm -hmm. uh, I believe in public service. Mm -hmm. And I think Michael's exactly correct when he mentioned about why would anyone run for office in today with all of the kinds of uh, cameras and jumping on every word. But I think sometimes the misinformation that's out there Yep. I mean, one of the things I like the most about Lincoln is he always called Jefferson Davis what he was. And it was a treasonous act against the United States of America. And that Robert E. Lee was treasonous against the United States of America. He always kept them in the box of what they were doing was against the United States. And I think that's what we have to do. So when we start talking about January 6th, are we talking about doing audits on elections that have already been held by people elected by their peers to supervise these elections? We need to constantly reaffirm, do you belong to the union or you belong to the Confederacy? Because I believe we are going through a civil war right now. It's not a shooting civil war, but it is a civil war and we need to call people out. And let's keep it not a shooting civil war, but let's, let's also deal with this civil war. Uh, right. Thank you. Mayor Hancock, uh, character traits, you know, virtues, values that are important to you and, and who do you admire and, and why? Yeah, I appreciate it. And I love Mayor Webb's list because when you think of Lincoln, Frederick Douglass and Mandela, you, you see some common traits. Faith, um, I'm always worried about people who don't believe in something higher than that. Um, and so I think faith is critically important. It plays a tremendous role in my life. And I, I look for those people who believe in something 
to carry them through those difficult, challenging times. Humility. Um, and every one of those individuals that were named out, uh, humility um, is huge. Uh, third is, you know, who keeps the, the people and their service in front of them. Uh, I admire, for example, Esther in the Bible, uh, who put her own self-interest aside to protect her people, knowing that if she was found out, she'd be in danger. But she did it because it was the right thing to do. Courage. Think about Frederick Douglass and Dr. King, Gandhi, the era in which these people operated. I mean, we think, I think it gets lost in the speeches. You think about the fact homes were bombed, families were at risk. Um, the era in which Frederick Douglass was out there doing what he was doing uh, to master the or, you know, the oratorial, the art of oral uh, communication and to be seen as he was, as big as he was. Um, you know, I picture him as a guy as big as Wellington Webb. But during that era, as a black man that large, they killed you. They didn't keep you around. And yet he was still agitating for the right cause. And then, of course, I look at folks who are wise, um, and, you know, who, who, again, are spiritual, who are wise, and ask for guidance for the right reason. Solomon, when God said, what is it I can do for you? What do you want? He says, I want wisdom so I can lead the people. And, and, and that, to me, is the kind of story that, that I keep in mind. I'm, I need just guidance and wisdom to make the right decisions for the betterment of everyone. I love that. And, and just, just from the conversation, both of you are doing an admirable job at, at living your lives uh, in alignment with those values and, uh, and character traits. It's, a, it's inspiring, to be honest with you. So thank you for that. Um, I'm going to pivot now. And, um, you know, we've talked a little bit about uh, your, your predecessors, right? Because you, you, you started the conversations um, really delightfully acknowledging um, what you took away from your predecessor and, and, and then shared with each other as well. Um, let's, let's just talk a little bit about uh, the next or future mayor. Um, you know, the, the astute participant in today's will undoubtedly note that um, all of us are, well, males, right? <laughs> so I'm curious to hear from the two of you, um, when when might we see a woman as mayor of Denver and, and what needs to happen in order for that to, to be a reality? You know, I think um, this upcoming mayoral election, you're gonna see the most vi vile, uh, uh, viable pool of women candidates for mayor in the history of the city. Um, and that's pretty exciting. Um, so I think the possibility of a, a, a woman being elected mayor uh, in 2023 is a very real possibility. Denver is good. Denver likes good people to serve as mayor. Uh, and we, we got some good women who are coming along and I think they'll make ultimately make a very wise decision on who the next mayor will be. Um, but this will be the best, most viable uh, pool we've seen. That's great. That's encouraging. That's encouraging. Mayor Webb. Um, I don't know if anyone mentioned um, Mayor Pena, Secretary Pena couldn't be with us today. Right. Uh, I think that uh, Secretary Pena, when he was elected mayor, it was transformational for the city. It changed the city's dynamic from, from a person that was much older, uh, had more of a laissez-faire management style to youth, youthful invigorance and vision. And uh, it was Federico's position to build the airport. And I thought, and I've said this publicly, I thought that was the easier decision. It was difficult, but I thought the location of where he placed it was most important mm -hmm. because most of the business community wanted the airport located between South Denver and Colorado Springs. He, moved, he said, let's build it Northeast, mm -hmm. which then allowed for growth in Adams County and Northeast Denver. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I, I agree with uh, Mayor Hancock. Um, There'll be a lot of viable women, um, and to get elected, it's 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 a gauntlet that you go through, and uh, we've all gone through it. You know, Federico was the first uh, minority mayor of Denver. I was first black mayor, and there's going to be a first woman mayor of Denver. Mm -hmm. And I think that um, whoever wins that, they have to go through the gauntlet the same as we did. There's a lot of viable candidates out there, or we will soon see. 
how viable they are <laughs> when they run. But uh, I think it's going to give the uh, population a real opportunity to choose. But I think that one of Denver's successes have been is that Federico and I knew each other, Michael and I have known each other, Hickenlooper and I have known each other. There's been a great continuance in Denver of mayors who have known each other, who have worked together, who have built upon each other's successes and who had this might be the first time someone comes out of a, 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 a milieu that no one knows. Mm. And that's gonna be interesting to see how that person plays. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we hope they will demonstrate the wisdom, of course, of leaning on the long line of, of uh, living former mayors to seek guidance because you can't figure this out. Uh, Chancellor, I'll tell you, I was president of city council had worked very closely with, uh, interned for Federico Pena, worked closely with Mayor Webb when he was in office, had been in this office over a hundred times, I'm sure, in meetings and discussions over my lifetime. But until you walk in this office, having just raised your right hand and taking the role as mayor of the city and that door shuts behind you, you realize the, 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 the extent in which the power and the influence of this office has, but also the responsibility. It's a, there's one mayor, one mayor. And I can't tell you a number of times I said at this conference table, I'm sure Mayor Weddick's experience as well, when they say, Mayor, this is your call. And you know the decision you're gonna make impacts the lives of a lot of people. Um, so it's a very, you know, we, we gotta take, as we always do, I think uh, great thought into who the next leader would be. Uh, but like I said, I think that there's a real possibility that in 2023, you can see the first uh, woman elected as mayor of Denver. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I think this, it's going to be an exciting election here. And uh, uh, Mayor Webb, for a moment there, I thought maybe you were going to um, throw your daughter in the ring there, but I, I, I got to keep her here at the University of Denver. <laughs> Let me say this. Stephanie is, is as good as whatever she would like to do. Absolutely. And one of the reasons is she's a DU alum. I'll just go up. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we're gonna have a little fun before we close up here. Um, and you know, Mayor Webb, you can, again, thank your daughter for this one. I'm gonna start with you. Um, rumor has it that many of the decisions you made while mayor were contemplated or made while watching Western movies. <laughs> of which Western movie would you watch today as inspiration to solve some of the greater challenges that currently exist in our, in our lives? I'm not sure. Um, I love Western movies. Um, I've seen The Gunfight at O.K. Corral maybe seven times in each of its versions from one of the first ones that came out, My Darling Clementine, to The Gunfight at O.K. Corral, to the later, to the last one that really came, Wyatt Earp, and then Tombstone with Val Kilmer and uh, Kurt Russell. <laughs> and I always liked that one scene, I'll Be Your Huckleberry. Uh, so Jeremy, I, that way I can tell whether you watched it or not. <laughs> uh, but they were morality plays about good and evil, and uh, and I always liked the idea of the lone sheriff, a lone marshal coming into town trying to make order, of uh, and the decision maker. I never was afraid of making decisions, even if they were wrong, because I think what mayors do, you have more opportunities to make decisions. People can criticize someone where they only make one decision, the mayor maybe has to make 50 in a day. And the likelihood is they may miss on one or two, but they'll make the other 48 might be good. And, and I'll just give you one quick caption. Uh, we had a student come in off the street saying he needed money for school. He's going to Howard and he was in dreads, had his pants sagging. And my staff said, well, we're not sure that's somebody we should be helping to try to get a scholarship. And I had them call back and they said, well, he do a, here on Monday and a year's behind. And, uh, and I thought it was something that his mother would send him to the mayor's office to seek help. And I said, I'll, I'm going to help you. All I ask is two things. One, we will pay your tuition. But what I ask of you is you help somebody else along the way and you come see me up on when, when you graduate. Uh, now, my staff had picked three or four other folks that were all top of the line, top candidates who were gonna graduate anyway. This young man was in the middle, wasn't quite sure whether he would make it or not. But fortunately he did because he got help from somebody because all of us in life get help from somebody. 
And the question is, do we remember it and do we reach back to bring someone along with us? That's a great one. That's a great one. Thank you for sharing that. Mayor Hancock, is there any, I mean, do you have any similar sort of things you fall back on when you're confronted with making tough decisions? I mean, Western movies aside. <laughs> you know what, if you ever spend any time around uh, Mayor Webb, you're going to get some movie reference, uh, one of his Westerns. Uh, what's the horse that you always talk about? The big horse movie, racing horse uh, movie that he always <laughs> talks about. Uh, but he, he is a historian all by himself. But yeah, you know, there, there are movies and characters out there that uh, I often think about. Here's one that might surprise you. Uh, actually, two. One is in terms of being an African-American. I go back and watch the series of Roots mm -hmm. over and over again. And I used to make my kids watch it every year and during Black History Month. And even today, there were so many um, lessons and metaphors in, and true um, stories, uh, sub-stories in Roots that is real and germane even to the African-American experience today um, that I, I often think about. Um, but the movie that would surprise you is probably Black Panther. And I think Black Panther is an example, you know, with the, you know, playing and starring the, the great late uh, Chadwick Boseman. Um, here is the leader of a country, a powerful country, who has the power to wipe out the rest of the world. And you remember the battle and decision he was, he had was, do I use this power and influence to create a revolution? And that's what his nemesis came to do. It's time for us to take over. But he had such a uh, focus on humanity and wisdom toward humanity. And the philosophy, just because you can, doesn't mean you should. And that's the same thing that when I walk around the gym, you love to work out and exercise. Mayor Webb loves to be in the gym and working out. And we see people lifting more weight than they should, right? And I see a guy try to lift the house every time I'm in there with him. And I said, this dude is going to be absolutely bent over when he's older. And that whole philosophy for me when I work out is just because you can lift it doesn't mean you should lift it. Work out at a scale that allows you to get good exercise and to finish a set. And the same thing with the United States of America, the same thing with leadership. We have an awful lot of power here um, in this country. And in the mayor's office, there's power vested in the mayor's office. But the integrity comes with how do you strategically and thoughtfully execute your duties without losing the humanity uh, of really the integrity of humanity. And I think that's what Black Tam Panther was all about for me. And and uh, the philosophy, just because you can, doesn't mean you should. And you care about the people more than you care about the exercise of your power. Yeah, it is, it's a great, great movie. Wow. Okay, we are at time. Um, and I, what I'd like to do is uh, quickly pull out snippets that I heard here. Um, products of our expectation. Mm -hmm. uh, power, use it or, you, or lose it, but don't forget your humanity. Mayor Hancock, that you just added. Collaboration at the speed of trust. Mm -hmm. Know your authorizing environment. Those are just some of the wonderful, incredible takeaways. Uh, we covered civil discourse, we covered character, virtue, and values. Uh, we covered uh, the signature projects and some of the great challenges. I cannot thank you enough uh, for this time with, with you all. This is a very special treat. Uh, for our entire University of Denver community, um, but especially me during this week, um, because these lessons of leadership are ones that I need to take away as well moving forward. So on behalf of all of us at the University of Denver, Mayor Hancock, Mayor Webb, Senator Hickenlooper, thank you so much for your time today. It's been a real joy. Thank you, Chancellor. Thank, thank you. Care, thank, thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs>